Welcome to my review and thoughts on Caravan of Courage and Ewok Adventure, the first Ewok movie that was made, and it, right, and it's from 1984. Now, yeah, um, I want to start by telling you I thought this movie was fine. Uh, I get why some people love it. I get why some people hate it. And I, I definitely want to say, you know, there's some, there's definitely some talent on display, and my, the fact that I didn't love this movie is not because, like, I think it's perfectly fine that it was made for kids. I don't really see a problem with Star Wars for kids. It's not a franchise that, you know, doesn't, like, I don't want, like, the thing for kids, you know. Let's see. Um, yeah, I will make some jokes, but none at the expense of members of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, in Return of the Jedi, I don't like the Ewoks. That's especially because the movie is, you know, George Lucas famously makes Star Wars movies for ages 12 and up. The Ewoks, with ease, defeat a significant contingent of the Empire's elite troops. You know, it's... It's those two things that bug me. These two made-for-TV Ewok movies, I haven't watched the second one yet, but I, currently it's looking like I'll do it next week, next Wednesday. But yeah, it's very clear, children of the target audience, the Ewoks go on adventures that feel like they fit Ewoks better, so it doesn't bother me that they're centered on Ewoks. And yeah, I'm one of the few people to cover this not in the lead-up to one of the Disney Star Wars films. Which I respect. That's a good way to get, you know, attention for your content. And, uh, right, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because that it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that it says or not, this is not that review. Now, <clears throat> I realize this video is long. I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where, if I spoil anything, I'll verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. Please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the franchise. Not ones released later, but set earlier. Only ones released earlier. Even though they are apparently all set later. Or at least, Return of the Jedi is. Anyway. Uh, and as soon as I the review yourself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. <clears throat> so, this movie is rated TVG, and that makes a lot of sense. Like, there's maybe one scene where I felt like, okay, this is a little bit intense for a G-rated movie. But the way it's filmed and edited, I can understand why it got away with a G. And yeah, you know, it's, yeah, to, to quote the IMDb Parents Guide, mild violence and gore, mild frightening and intense scenes, and that's, that's it. And that brings us to... Right, so this is the first time I watch it, and I, let's see, the version, yeah, there's apparently a couple of different versions of this. The one I watched is the Disney Plus one for here in Western Europe. I am not entirely sure, yeah, based on what IMDb says about alternate versions I'm not entirely sure which, you know, there's the original VHS release, uh, which is presumably what it originally aired on television, and the 2004 DVD release. And, yeah, but this is, it doesn't sound like big changes, it's just like credits, yeah, it's not like re-edited. <clears throat> I do want to note, for anyone who hasn't watched as far as I can tell, they haven't, like, you know, George Lucas did not do one of his infamous re, you know, special edition, you know, on, on this one. 
this one, the, the special effects look the way they did in 84, the way that, you know, before the special editions, you know, I've, I've talked to some, I've, I've never seen them myself, but I've talked to some people who watched the original versions of the original trilogy movies, and, like, if you know where to look, you can, you can see wires and, and stuff like that, and, you know, not really wires in this movie, but you can tell, like, the effects don't hold up quite as well. They haven't done the, like, smoothing out, and I'm not defending the special editions here, but there were a couple of things done there that you can understand why, you know, and, and, yeah, it just, it doesn't look as good, this one, and I realize that's also partially being a TV movie. Now, let's see, yeah, so, the plot. IMDb does a good job here. Wicked the Ewok and his friends agree to help two shipwrecked human children, Mace and Sindel, on a quest to find their parents. And that is... Right, so the... The writing here handled by, you know, George Lucas himself wrote the story and Bob Carrow wrote the the script itself and he went on to write 14 of the tw 26 episodes of the Ewok TV show, the, the animated show. And yeah, other than this, he's written a bunch of different... Yeah, it looks like everything he's ever written was for for kids. Uh, yeah, just briefly go over <clears throat> the Wizard of Oz, a 1990 TV series. Alan the Chipmunks, the 1990 TV series. Tiny Toon Adventures, also 1990 TV series. Um, yeah, stuff I've never heard of. Clifford the Big Red Dog and Tales from the Endor Woods. Wait, is that okay? That is um, okay. Animated, grown up, wicked remembers four adventures from his youth in the Ewok village. It's like, yeah, they took. I'm almost certain this. It's one of those where they took like episodes. Maybe stuff from the the live action movies and and like, you know they they made a framing device. Yeah, it says right here, edited from the Ewoks TV show. Anyway, um, you know he he definitely knows how to appeal to to children. There's a lot of stuff in here that is very much like the kind of thing that kids you know, feel seen by, but, you know, adults, maybe not necessarily, you know, and that's also, I, I do want to make clear, given that this was always made for kids, I don't think, you know, it's fine that we adults don't like it, and I, th there definitely are reasonable criticisms to make, I don't think it makes that much sense to, like, go into to this movie expecting it to appeal very much to adults. So I, I don't know that it's, you know, it can be fun, and I used to do it myself, but I don't think it, I don't know that it's the most useful criticism to, you know, yeah, criticize it saying, oh, you know, this wouldn't appeal to adults. It was never meant to. You know, the, the I, I don't know how you would ever get the idea, you know, like, um, this is one of the only Star Wars things where the protagonists are children. And, well, uh, one child, one teenager. You know, the, the, there are, like, human adults, but they don't, you know, they get kidnapped very early in the story, and we don't spend that much time with them. And, yeah, that's, that's very, very unusual for, for Star Wars. So, so yeah. Um, let's see... Yeah, I mean, I wish it wasn't quite so episodic, but I do appreciate that, like, the different, 
let's go with episodes, the different things they, yeah. The minor plot stuff that they go through, you know, it's stuff that kids can, like, at, at one point, someone is, is ill and needs medicine, you know, that's the kind of, like, you know, every, every kid can probably remember either being sick or one of their friends being sick. And, you know, yeah, like, making friends, you know, it's, it's very, yeah, I, the individual episodes are fine. It's just, it's frustrating that it is episodic. I, I think it would have been better if it had started out as, which I'll, I'll get into shortly, it did not start out being planned as um, one feature. And it was directed by John Corti. I'm not sure he's directed anything else. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. He directed uh, 13 episodes of Sesame Street between 73 and 89. So, again, you know, knows how to appeal to kids. Knows how to make stuff that a kid can that that kids can sit and watch and get into that they aren't, like, confused by or scared by, made sad by. Or, or I suppose, you know, there might be stuff that's, like, somewhat intense, but it won't, like, overwhelm them with, with fear. And, yeah, a lot of what he's done is, like, TV stuff, like this also is. And um, right, he has done some stuff. I'm, I mean, I'm guessing Deadly Matrimony and Children of the Mist are not for kids. <laughs> Mrs. Scrooge, which like appears to not only be like Scrooge gender swapped or largely gender swapped, not. As, as far as I can tell, it, yeah, there are some, some men in it, but in fact, like, Black, uh, you know, Christmas Carol, that's very cool. I, you know, I mean, it only has a 5.4 on IMDb, so it's maybe not great, but, you know, representation is extremely important, so I support. <clears throat> Speaking of support, please support the SAC After Strike. There will be links in the description box. Now, yeah, so, yes, so that you know where I stand on it, um, this is my ranking of all of the Star Wars films. I'm. It is possible that at the end of the review I'll update it with this one, but for now it's without this one. So, ranking them worst to best. Episodes 2, 3, 1, 9, 6, Solo, Episode 7, Rogue One, Episode 4, 5, and 8. And let's real quick add to the bottom. There we go. This is one of those films, if you absolutely hate this film, you might really enjoy watching the start of the second film, and vice versa. Now, this movie is more like the 1988 Willow than the, you know, pretty much anything Star Wars. It's sort of like a trial run for 1988 Willow. And while that movie can also, there's, there's somewhat of an episodic aspect to that one, it does have a very clear through line and the episodes just hit harder. It feels like stuff is being accomplished, which is something I wouldn't quite say of this movie. And, yeah. Um, Industrial Light Magic did do the effects for this, and it does show... It, it is, you know, sadly also, it's somewhat on a budget, and that does also show. And... Let's see... Yeah, um, basically, Mace is, he's basically, he's the equivalent of a racist. He's not willing to give the Ewoks a chance, no matter how benevolent they clearly are, and from right away, right away at that. I won't give away whether it happens or not, but obviously, you as a viewer hope that he can overcome his racism. 
1988 also criticized racism and the inclusive nature of the original trilogy definitely promotes the accurate idea that diversity is our strength. And conservative movies of the 80s had a lot of racism, so I really appreciate this fighting back. And, you know, the, the siblings are, the human siblings are very concerned about their parents since they realize they're in a Star Wars property. Parents of protagonists tend to be, their, be dead or evil. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I have some critic quotes. And let's see. Yeah, one points out, you know, your movie, your opinion of this movie may depend on whether you like the Ewoks in Return of the Jedi or not. <coughs> and, yeah, John Cordy isn't. I, Irvin Kirshner or Richard Marquand, but he does a competent job directing and shooting this movie. The story reminds me of Wizard of Oz, very simple but colorful, full of places to explore. Peter Bernstein is no John Williams, but the score is pretty good in its own right. The acting isn't anything special, but it's serviceable enough. Special effects are pretty good for a low-budget film made in 1984. Let's see, Gorax the Giant had a pretty Design is nothing special, but the film is a solid family film that knows what it is. Better than the holiday special attack of clones and the Phantom Menace, in my opinion. Let's see. And yeah, one, one person said, you know, it was better when I saw it as a kid, thought it moved kind of slow for an adventure. Didn't care for the narration either, made the film feel like an Animal Planet program. I do briefly want to say, like, I I saw someone, like, there's apparently a rumor that, I don't think it has been confirmed at least, that the narration was added because a, like, one of the execs saw an early cut and said that they couldn't follow it. And... I know sometimes I over, what's the word, overanalyze. I think it was that this executive, now I know that Lucas himself was very left-wing, and I'm sure he got as many left-wingers around him while making the early Star Wars as he could. I can imagine, you know, Hollywood is fairly conservative, uh, you know, it, it will it will pretend to be left-leaning, to appeal to left, you know, leftists in the audience, but, yeah, it's, um, you know, Some More News did a really great video talking about how conservative Hollywood actually is when you get down to it. I think it was a... You know, the, the studio executive who saw it was conservative, and, you know, he maybe wouldn't say it out loud, maybe he didn't even realize it consciously, but I think he was racist. I think if this exact same thing, or, uh, I suppose, xenophobic makes more sense to say, he was, the fact that it was these little teddy bears, you know, there, there aren't very many, like, human characters in this. Most of the time... When we see humans, it's just Mace and Sindel. There's way more Ewoks. Because this studio exec didn't, you know, couldn't relate to the Ewoks, he said that he, you know, he felt that he couldn't follow the story. Because, like, children of average intelligence watching this don't need the narration. It's easy to figure out what's going on. I, I can't imagine some adults who've forgotten what it's like to be a child and what it's like to see the world that way. You know, like, it's it's a lot of the stuff that's explained is very basic, like, folk tale stuff. Like, there's there's one point where they're, you know, they're about to go on a quest, on the quest to, to save the parents. And, like, you know, they meet someone, they meet, a, you know, they go to an Ewok who looks different from the other ones. And he's, like, giving the individual members objects. If you know anything about folk tales, it's like, oh, he's, like, some kind of, like, wizard or something. What he's giving them is magic. You know, the, the, these, are, these are magical objects. 
they have some sort of uh, property that make them useful for this quest here. You don't, this is not something that needs explaining. It, it feels silly for me to even sit here and explain it to you because we all know this. Like, this is, this is very, very basic folktale stuff. You know, yeah, sure. I guess if you've never heard a folktale before, but I, this is not supposed to be the first folktale here. This was made for kids who had been told some of these folktales, you know. Now, See, but but yeah, you know, if this movie was the exact same, but with white dudes instead of Ewoks, I really don't think that it would have been that that anyone would have ever thought that it needed narration. <clears throat> so back to critic quotes. Let's see. It, yeah, it it ramps. It has elements of Star Wars, but it ramps up the fantasy elements of the series. Ewoks possess real magic. Their tribal rituals are shown to be effective in power. When taken together with narrative structure, the film is very much a fairy tale by design. The film utilizes a narration that adds to its holiday fable feel. I do agree. And, you know, delivered by Burl Ives, who most will recognize as the narrator of the classic Rankin Bass Girl for the Red Nosed Reindeer holiday special. I agree. You know, I do appreciate it. it's, you know, it's cool that they got him. And I appreciate that it does have some of that effect. But it does, you can tell that it wasn't originally supposed to have narration. It's not built in a way that requires narration. The narration is there because someone thought that it would be too difficult to follow without, and they were wrong about that. Now, yeah, and, and various people have pointed out, it, there's a sort of feeling of a nature documentary at times. Uh, let's see. Yeah, furthermore, the film utilizes real-life earth animals, including llamas, ponies, lizards, and ferrets, in order to save on visual effects, the effect is a strange blurring of the film's setting and genre. Let's see. Yeah, and, and one per per person points out, the voiceover dis appears and disappears randomly throughout the film. You know, it very much is. Like, the guy, you know, I don't know if he said, okay, here are the chunks of the film that I didn't understand, or if he said, I don't understand it. And then someone sat down and watched, like, the entire thing, and they were like, I don't, what is he talking, what doesn't he understand, okay, I guess, I guess we could spell this out, sure. Let's see. And, yeah, one, let's see. Yeah, one person says, even if this is not the bottom of the Star Wars barrel, it's way the heck down there. Not the least of its problems are the Ewoks themselves. They are not, in Return of the Jedi, all-time great movie creatures. For whatever budgetary reason, they were constructed without much sophistication or care. Even the ones who get featured with a lot of screen time. They had glassy, unblinking eyes, crappy little rubber lips that didn't move in any discernible way when they were emitting noises that were supposed to be speech. And this is something I definitely wanted to, to say. I think that... In both this and Return of the Jedi, they do they do a lot with body language. And that's good because you get nothing for like I get it. I get that they didn't just want to make holes for the actor's eyes. But yeah. You get nothing from the eyes, you get nothing from the, the faces that, you know, barely move, if at all. Yeah. It's it's too bad. I, I think they would have been a lot better if they could move just a little bit more and the eyes allowed for a little bit more expression and it is especially you know it's not the biggest problem in Return of the Jedi it's a problem here because like they're not that big a part of that movie they're not they don't have a huge amount of screen time just you know a couple of days ago I, I rewatched their scenes and it's really not very much you know, and, and, you know, those of us who don't like them in the movie, it's not that they have that much screen time, it's that they are so important and that they stand such stark contrast. You know, this is a movie where early in the movie, Leia 
choked to death Jabba the Hutt. You know, this is not, it's not a, it's not a kid's movie. You know, we see how he's like struggling to breathe and she's like really tightening the chain. Like it's, you know, I, anyone who watched this, anyone who was the right age to watch this movie, if they tried to watch that movie, I can imagine they would end up like terrified, screaming and crying. The, but, but yeah, they, you know, they don't have a huge amount of screen time there. They do here and it hurts the movie that it's the same designs that they didn't. And I get, you know, with the budget, they weren't going to redesign from the ground. It, yeah. Uh, let's see. Right, and back to the critic. Frankly, they're the most unpleasant looking element of the whole movie, and Jedi is already the most threadbare of the Star Warses outside of the exemplary battle sequences, but cheap for Star Wars is still enough to make it surely the most polished high production value release of 1983. Their generally impressive surroundings and co-stars help to make the Ewoks look somewhat acceptable in their first appearance, but now age the suits by a year and subject them to the lower budget cinematography of a television production and a cinematographer, Jordan Cordy, who hadn't shot anything in a full decade. He was also the project's director, had much more recent experience in that role, not that it did much good, and the result are, results are pretty dire indeed. For something whose solitary function is to make the Ewoks look so adorable and appealing that every child in America would swivel around at the first commercial break, desperately ask their parents to buy them an Ewok doll for Christmas, the Ewok adventure is shockingly terrible at doing that. As much as possible, Cordy keeps the acting piping along in medium and wide shots, the better to suggest that the Ewoks are in some way articulate without actually having to make them so, but sometimes a close-up simply can't be avoided. Let's see... And... <clears throat> yeah, originally uh, Lucas came up with the story for a one-hour special. The writer and director stretched it to a two-hour special, and it really shows. Let's see. Right, and uh, yeah, at its core, the Ewok adventure is basically a crimping of various fairy tales. Uh, screenwriter Bob Caro even said as much himself. You can see elements with the two lost children, the Ewoks, the giant Gorax. There's more than a few similarities to things like Babes in the Woods, Handsome Gretel, Brave Little Tailor, Jack of the Beanstalk, to a degree Goldilocks, and the Three Bears. This would be perfectly fine if it were a half hour special as was intended, but despite being expanded, to 97 minutes or two hours of commercials, the characters are rather flat, with neither of the child characters particularly engaging, with Sindel mostly reiterating how much she misses her parents, Mace being abrasive or trying to pass himself off as much older than he actually is. And the movie has clear signs of padding because the actual adventure, part of this Ewok adventure, doesn't even really begin until about 50 minutes in, with a lengthy sequence of Sindel being sick, taking up the first half hour, Mace and Sindel getting trapped by a creature after trying to find their way back to the crash site. Even once we get moving on the adventure, there's not all that much that happens, with a lot of the perils they face uh, usually coming more from the clumsiness or carelessness of Wicked Mace rather than any existential threat. I will say that the effects, makeup, and costuming still look decent, as despite only costing about $3 million filmed in the California Redwood Forest, it still feels like it's in the same universe as Star Wars. The effects used to create the Gorex are quite impressive, and it's clear that sequence... Let's see... Um, yeah, there's one specific sequence where most of the effects work went, and it is quite impressive by TV standards, very true. And... I knew going into it that it would be very episodic, and maybe like, I guess I won't say exactly how long, it, but a little bit into it, I felt like, okay, this is moving along, fine. But then that first episode of the episodic nature ended, and they started on another, and it kind of kills the momentum. Like, I, it would have been great if they just had, like, like Willow does, if there was one specific thing from the right way, you know, Willow 1988 is not my favorite movie or anything, but like, I think even people who hate it would have to agree. The plot starts right away, like immediately, like we're talking just a few minutes in, you are 100%, you know, yeah, not, not really a, a spoiler about that movie to say, you know, it's about this evil... There's this evil queen who knows magic. She's scared that this 
this person called Elora Dannon will defeat her. Elora Dannon is born, and, you know, yeah, uh, someone gets her away from the queen. The rest of the movie, the good guys are trying to protect Elora Dannon and defeat the evil queen. You know, there's definitely, like, not everything... There are definitely scenes that, if you don't like what they're doing with that scene, you're going to find that scene very frustrating. But it all relates to that. Like, the movie never just stops what it's doing and then does something else. And that does happen here. Like, you could, you could remove the first of the, of the episodes completely. And the only thing you'd lose is screen time. It it changes nothing, and and that really, yeah. I also, I think this movie would be a lot better if it really was just about Ewoks, if there were no humans at all, and you didn't, you wouldn't have to change very much, because at the end of the day, you know, it's not about oh, you know, humans and Ewoks, they're completely different. No, it's just you know, here's some humans, here's some Ewoks, they have to work together because the human parents are missing, like. You could, like, if you wanted there to be a different thing, you could make it different tribes of Ewoks, you know, but someone felt, rightly or wrongly, kids are going to have an easier time relating if there's human kids, you know, they can imagine that they're Sindel and or Mace, you know, and that's, and, yeah, I, I think that was a, yeah. I, th I think the movie would have been better if it was just about Ewoks. Let's see, um, including if they still didn't subtitle any of it, because really, you don't need the human kids, the, the human characters there saying what they're thinking and feeling. It comes across in the body language of Ewoks, and the music, and some of the cinematography and editing also backed up. Now, according to one critic, the, the Sindel actress... Um, Aubrey Miller couldn't read yet, and her memory couldn't retain the dialogue for long, so she would be fed a line right before a take, recite it, imitating the way it was said, which really explains her, her acting performance. I'm not going to go hard on that. She was a very little child. She didn't, like, I think, what was she, like, five or six when they filmed this? I don't think we should be harsh on on the acting of of such. You know, she does what she can. She's she clearly is like. I guess I won't say she's like trying to act. She she's trying to. She she can appreciate that she's supposed to seem like she feels a certain way, and she's trying... I feel like there's a disconnect between her saying the dialogue and her just trying to get the the performance across with, like, just body language and, and such, which is obviously unfortunate, but the body language is, like, you know, she's, she's sick for some of it, and she, it doesn't feel like she doesn't understand what she's being asked to do. It just... The, the dialogue feels like she doesn't completely, you know, like she, it doesn't feel like she means what she's saying, but like, you know, she's not moving very much, like they, you know, she looks very, very sad and weak and just, you know, yeah, <clears throat> for those parts. Let's see, and... Yeah, one person says, it doesn't feel like Star Wars is almost unbearable to watch for anyone above the age of eight. It's not made just so that kids can watch it. It's made exclusively for small children to watch. This is completely unlike one of those Pixar movies where there's something for the adults. The story is incredibly thin. It takes them forever to decide to go on the caravan. The first chunk of it is dealing with Sindel being sick. There's not quite enough medication, so they have to go get medication. The movie looks and feels like a TV movie, the only exception being the special effects. And the child actors and their characters are terrible. Let's see. One says, I really do still love the old school mixture of practical puppet effects and stop motion it employs throughout. Same here. 
the score by Peter Bernstein, who's doing a sugary take on the Star Wars house style. It quotes Return of the Jedi at times. Much more of a kid's film than the parent series. This even has a narrator who sounds like he's telling a bedtime story. Simplistic and earnest, while the middle section has a huge amount of padding. Um, yeah, that was actually... I. Um, one of them... One of my fellow countrymen, one of my fellow Danes, said that it reminded him of, like, watching something that had been made by another country for children in another language. So, like, someone at the studio, you know, someone at the, the you know, making the, you know, who had, who had like, bought the rights to, to show it in Denmark... They were like, kids are not going to be able to follow this. There's too much, like, let's say, English dialogue, you know. Ah, it's going to be really expensive. We have to cast someone for every single character. You know what we'll do? We will get a narrator who will explain everything. And, and I'm really, really glad I'm not watching stuff like that. I remember watching, like, Lucky Luke, and it was just painful because, like, some of the time, like, the narrator would would repeat a line, but not be trying to imitate the way the line was said. And it's just, it feels very weird. Even as a kid, you're like, what is what is this? This is not good. But, but yeah, it feels very much like that. I don't know if very many Americans are going to be able to relate to that. I don't know if there are a lot of American... I think American ones usually just feature a full voice cast. Now, let's see. Right, and uh, yeah, Aubrey Miller, the girl who plays Sindel, is especially tiresome. All her close ups feel like take 73 of an insert that's had to be shot piecemeal for performance reasons. And, yeah, very true. A lot of scenes of people going to sleep, which I think, you know, that's probably very relatable for the, the children watching. Um, yeah, honestly, I think the, the movie is like 30%. Okay, that's an exaggeration. People just sleeping. Uh, yeah, some people say it's too violent for kids. Like, I would definitely say, you know, maybe seven or eight-year-olds can handle it. I don't think, like, five and six-year-olds would be able to, even though other parts of the movie feel like it's made for that. This was back when, like, even stuff made exclusively for children was sometimes very violent, which is, of course, you know, it, it that kind of goes with the folktale thing. You know, I remember as a kid thinking, like, holy crap, these, some of these fairy tales are terrifying. Let's see. And, yeah, 1% is like a bad version of Lord of the Rings, way too much walking. And that is very, like... There is a lot of walking in Lord of the Rings, but you actually care. You care about the characters, you care about the places they're going, and what's happening there. And that's just not quite true of this movie. Uh, Mace is probably the whiniest jerk in all of Star Wars, depending on how you feel about the younger versions of Anakin and Luke Skywalker. That's really saying something. Yeah. Less Star Wars, more Dungeons and Dragons with brats. Right, and some people really freak out about the fact that the forest moon of Endor has a desert, which, like, I mean, why does the entire planet have to be a forest? Why why can't you accept the parts of it? I don't understand that. Anyway, um, why is it called Ewok Adventure? It's not an adventure for the Ewoks, it's an adventure for the kids. The Ewoks don't get to do very much, that's very true. And that I do, like, when I read that before, or... Heard that, I think, in my uh, podcast review. When I heard that before, I was like, does that really matter? And then I watched it, and it's like, wow, like, you really... If these were not Ewoks, if this was just, like, English children who were interacting with, like, I don't know, French children, so, you know, there's a, there's a language barrier, it would not feel that much different, which, like, Return of the Jedi, it does actually feel different. It's not like it's the first time that we encounter aliens there, but here it's just, like, the Ewoks seem to like Sindel from right away, and at first they don't like Mace because the jerk attacks them even though there's no, there's absolutely no reason for it. 
they they you know once he once once um he gets vouched for by symbol when she's like no he's my brother they're like okay sure and it's like no but the ewoks like part of the thing with them you know I, you know some people love that some people hate that some people present it isn't the case they're kind of dangerous in return of the jedi like they actually they capture the the you know the the entire group almost right away you know as soon as they encounter them they have them surrounded and they're gonna you know they're gonna cook them and eat them and like you know some some people say that's why they feel that the Ewoks are not too childish for them you know it doesn't matter that much to me but seeing a movie where they aren't at all like that it, it just it feels like the movie was was made by and for people who don't know anything about Ewoks other than what they look like and sound like you know it's like I'm not saying that the movie would have been better if if they tried to cook and eat you know Sindel the child and mace the teenager but it just feels like there's not really any explanation for it like yeah, it just, you know, I, I just, I I feel like, because the thing is, Return of the Jedi sets up, if you are nice to an Ewok, they will be welcoming to you. If not, they're going to be hostile towards you. You know, the way that, the reason that Leia never, they, they never seem to even consider eating her, is because she gives wicked food. You know, and that's just, that's, yeah, you know, there's a lot of, like they, uh, the Ewoks are somewhat like a, a simple, a uh, not simple, a primitive tribe. And I use primitive not as a negative, but as a descriptive. You know, if you give them something, they'll be nice to you. And that's, you know, I mean, you you do have to prove to them that you're not out to hurt them. Which, let's be honest, Han does not do a good job of. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's kind of like. Why not just have Sindel hand the first Ewok she sees hand the, the Ewok something? Like, she seems to feel some sense of trust towards them from right away. And that's, you know, fine because, like, they're, they're roughly the same size and they're cute and fuzzy. But the fact that they trust her feels weird compared to Return of the Jedi. Uh, now, the film stars Eric Walker as Mace, a pride-filled, hot-headed, tough guy kid with a lot to learn ahead of him, the oldest of the Tawani children. Let's see. Right, and both of these movies, both of these Ewok live-action movies, were some of the last very intensive stop-motion animations produced by ILM, who honed their expertise techniques from none other than 2000 Space Odyssey. In some ways, this film plays out like a little... A little like Lord of the Rings, when a wise old Ewok named Logre, uh, played by Bobby Bell, gives each of the chosen adventurers a sacred token of the legendary Ewok warriors. This token helps them in their quest. Along the way, they each find out that these tokens contain incredible unique powers, which they use to evade some of the deadliest dangers of Endor. Uh, let's see... Right, and one person pointed out, if Wicked wasn't there, you could pretend it was set long before the original trilogy and it wouldn't violate canon. Others have said, you know, you could just pretend that Wicked, you know, we don't know how they age. Maybe they get much older, like we know that Yoda gets much, much older than humans do. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, George Lucas has for some reason said that this movie is set between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi even though that would mean that the Empire is somewhere on Endor building the, you know, the, set, setting up the, the shield generator thing and building the, the Death Star nearby. And it's like, I get that they didn't think the Ewoks were dangerous enough to bother with. And that's a decent message, you know, for Return of the Jedi that, you know, if you underestimate someone, they could, you know, judge me by my size, do you? But it's like they're not worried about all these other dangerous creatures on Endor. Like, you watch Return of the Jedi, it feels like, oh, I guess just there's nothing dangerous naturally occurring on Endor. There's like, there's the 
There's the Ewoks who will leave you alone if you treat them well. And then there's the Empire, you know. But according to this movie, there's a lot of dangerous things. It just, it feels like, I'm not saying they wouldn't necessarily choose somewhere else, but I feel like they would probably, like, go around killing all these things. You know, that's what fascists would do in this situation, so it just feels weird. One person says, you can see fingerprints on some claymation here. I didn't see any of that. I It might have been an exaggeration. Uh, right, some people flipped out about the fact that there's no opening text crawl. Like, it's a spin-off. It's not an official Star Wars. What would the text crawl do? Like, what did you need explained by a text crawl? Like, if you take one of the actual episode, you know, one of the nine episode movies of Star Wars and take out the text crawl, there's stuff in there that you needed to know before the movie starts. But with this, not really. Right, and some people said, since when do the Ewoks have flying gliders? Whereas others point out, cool to see that the Ewoks already had flying gliders, like in Return of the Jedi. Like, some, some people just really wanted to hate this movie, and just forgot stuff that's I mean that's one of the most memorable things of the Ewoks is the gliders like I don't yeah anyway that brings us to yeah the the opening does a decent job setting the tone I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending um, the ending fits with what came before I think the ending is fine. I, it didn't hit as hard as it was meant to because I just wasn't that invested in the characters. I, I do think some of the last scenes of the movie are f compelling, some of the best of the movie. Now, that brings us... Yeah, I don't have a lot to say about the characters. Um... You know, like with Willow, it's very cool to see something that employs so many little people, uh, dwarves, uh, dwarf actors, and yeah, I mean, they actually are distinct. You know, you can't see the actors' faces, but the the sort of behavior and body language is distinct enough. And the the dialogue is way too repetitive. Like, um, you don't the the Ewoks themselves, you basically just have to guess. It doesn't bother me that it's somewhat childish, though I can definitely go the rest of my life without ever hearing was it Wicked? It was one of the Ewoks repeatedly saying, Starcruiser? But the fact that they say the exact same, like, nobody needs to hear, my sister is sick, she needs medicine. Do you have medicine? Where is the medicine? Do you have more medicine? So many times, like, it's just, the kids don't need it to understand. I can imagine kids were probably annoyed with how repetitive it was as well. Maybe, maybe not. I can't say for sure. But, yeah, you know, there are times where it actually, the, there's some decent stuff, but like, um, they talk about missing their parents, which, you know, again, it's, it's too repetitive. But the first time they say it, it's, you know... At least hypothetically, it it's you know it's again it's something that kids can relate to, and that you know it's it's essentially it's one of those things where like kids can watch it and work through anxiety about losing their parents, but it doesn't need to be so repetitive for for that. Now the the cinematography very much limited by the the budget um, 
And, and, you know, yeah, I already quoted a critic as saying, you know, John Cordy, it had been too long since he last filmed something, and it, you know, it's hurt by that. Let's see. And, and yeah, just the, you know, the cinematography tends to not be particularly interesting. Like, you know, it's, it's passable, and you can see what's going on. You know, it's not that, but just... Yeah, it's it's not very interesting looking and not very. Yeah, uh, it was edited by John Nutt, who has 19 credits as editor and 103 for sound department. Um. Yeah, I I don't know any of this other stuff that he's edited. <coughs> Yeah, like the editing is is fine. It's it's not it's not really anything special. And some of the location shooting is pretty good. The music is handled by Peter Bernstein. I don't really have anything to add to what I quoted critics as saying. Yeah, so the movie is 95 minutes or 97 with credits and it feels at least 30 minutes longer maybe maybe almost an hour longer because the the stops start pacing now the the best element of the of the film is the the special effects i can't really claim that it's worth watching the entire movie even ones for the special effects, but like, you know, maybe the, you know, if you have Disney Plus, it's on Disney Plus, you can like skim it and just watch the effects parts. You, you aren't losing it. You're not missing out on anything. And yeah, the, the worst aspect is just like, these various production issues, the, the TV production quality, the acting, the, the thin to non-existent plot. Now, the worst thing, but, but yeah, and, and those are definitely problems for watching it as an adult or even teenager. I mean, I would probably say you should maybe watch it, watch at least the... the scary scenes by yourself before showing it to your kids but if you think those are fine you know you know your kids better than I do yeah um, showing it to a kid like it's not gonna it's not gonna make them stupider or something you know it's not yeah it's it's fine uh, you know if the kid doesn't already love Ewoks though I don't know that I would really bother it's clearly made for those who already love Ewoks if it you know I I know some people this was the first thing they saw Ewoks in and they loved it uh, you know maybe they wouldn't have if they didn't if they weren't kids when they first watched it but you know they were that was their experience I don't think that's gonna be the majority of people now, uh, yeah, so a common complaint I ran into from others was that it was too childish, and yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, don't don't try to watch it as adult. You know, I watched it because it's on Disney Plus, it's Star Wars, it's not Lego Star Wars, so yeah, working my way through the last little bit that I haven't already. But but and and I really really did get into some of the effect sequences, but yeah, if if that's not you, then yeah, you know, you might not be interested in watching it, and that's that's fine. So, uh, yeah, the thing I was most worried about was probably the episodic nature, and absolutely does, yeah, the movie is worse for it. The thing I was most looking forward to was the love of nature, and that is quite good. The trailer does give too much away, but it also gives you a decent idea of what the movie is like cover and poster do not give too much away and do give a decent idea of what it is like and then that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes where it 
And the mouse screws me again. So let's see if we can fix that. And that should do it. Let's see, trying to fill the dead air. And there we go. Right, so yeah, um, Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 21% on the tomato meter. Um, there are 14 reviews and 11 of them are rotten. 43% uh, audience score based on over 10,000 ratings. And yeah, um, the average critic score was 4.10 out of 10. The average rating by users was 3.1 out of 5, which is kind of high for, for not quite giving a positive, you know, any 3.5 and anything above is actually positive, but yeah, you know, that is worth noting. The people who, you know, they didn't hate it that much, apparently. Um, and it is not on Metacritic. On IMDb, there are 55 user reviews. If you don't count then credits, uh, uh, wow, I may not be fully awake. The spoilers, if you don't count the spoilers, there's 45. And of, so, so yeah, I've read all 55. You know, normally I read the top voted 100, but less than that here. And yeah, of the 55, none of them gave it a 1 out of 10, 2 gave it 2, 3 gave it 3, 4 gave it 4, 5 gave it 5. 8 gave it 6, 4 gave it 7, 4 gave it 8, 1 gave it 9, 14 gave it 10. So that is still a pretty substantial amount of people who loved it. Uh, there are 115 links in the IMDb External Reviews section. 90 of them worked and were in English. And... Yeah, so I've already talked some about the special effects. They're definitely, like... They're not the most impressive of the time, but they're almost definitely the most impressive of the time for TV movies. You know, it's it's unusual for a TV movie to be working with such a professional, you know, yeah. So, so the... And, and that does show. There's, there are some excellent stop-motion sequences in this. I, I wish that there were more. And that the, the, yeah. And, and there's also some great puppetry. I will say there's a couple of times where it's very obvious that something is stopped. I, I guess most of the time it's obvious that it's, you know, if, like, I guess, you know, kids, if it's the first time they watch stop motion, they're not going to be like, oh, it's stop motion. They're going to be like, that's not real, though. You know, which is not what I would say for the original trilogy. And that's it for the... Yeah. Um, I, I rank this... I rate this 5 furry forest dwellers saving kids out of 10. And, yeah... Um, It's not one of those movies that hold up particularly well. Like, the stuff that they did... You know, one of the things that one reviewer said that... You know, I also very much agreed with was... You know, this was back when TV movie was, like, almost an insult. Like, TV movies today can look amazing. But back then, it was... You know... Well, I mean, which... Obviously, not it's going to be as good as... A, you know studio picture, but whatever, we'll do it, you know, kind of thing. And there's also some things, like, I know, in the 80s, especially for kids stuff, this kind of thing of so much bickering and repetitive dialogue, it just, I don't know if kids liked it, but some adults who had power to, to make it happen definitely thought that it worked for kids, Today, it's not really... I've seen a couple of things that, that still have it, but, like... You know, if you watch something like Star Wars Rebels, which is definitely partially... You know, there's stuff there that appeals to kids. It's nowhere near as, as repetitive with, with dialogue. 
And yeah, um, I don't think this movie deserved better than it really got. Um, yeah. And yeah, so it does feel a little weird to say... Um, To, to be comparing this to the other to the Star War, to the to the non spin off Star Wars movies, but yeah, um, I like this better than the prequel trilogy because this movie didn't actually make it, it. This did make me feel things other than boredom, which I can't say for the prequels. And yeah, I mean the viewing experience was better than Rise of Skywalker. It wasn't so exhausting and like all over the place yeah um that brings us to the the thoughts section so first section notes taken while watching as usual these are on paper and yeah so you know, the opening does a decent job setting an atmosphere, and the Gorax is really cool. I, I wish we saw much more of it. And I do hear that the second one has much more of a villain presence. Let's see. It kind of made me chuckle, the glider very suddenly, you know, going off because it was like a goat chewed through the, the rope. And let's see. Yeah, and you know, so apparently, like Sindel and Mace both, like, essentially ran away from home. And you know, yeah, you know, little children can probably relate to sometimes feeling like, you know, things would be better if mom and dad weren't constantly telling them what to do, kind of thing. And. Yeah, so not a big fan of Mace pantomiming. Early on, it felt like there was way too much. Like, Ewoks were either constantly talking or there was constant, like, slapstick or other shtick. And, you know, Mace asks, you know, what hurts? And she says, everything. Ah, she read the reviews. And, you know, she says, I wish mom and dad were still here to take care of me. And he's like, don't worry, I'll take care of you. Yeah, that's what she's worried about. And, yeah, I felt like Mace was being paid by the word and, and told that he would be paid even if he said the same several words over and over. <clears throat> like, he gets, he gets better, but not by that much. He's annoying throughout the entire thing. I didn't hate the the creature in the in the tree hole or the creature if you will. Let's see. Yeah, and I think Mace is supposed to be relatable to to young boys and and like young girls are maybe supposed to be like, "Oh, that's just like my brother." He ends up being really annoying, which, you know, that happens a lot in a kind of in in stuff that's for younger audiences. See. You know, I mean, I, I appreciate that he wants to, he's very protective of Sindel, he doesn't really respect her or listen to her, he seems like he's always unhappy about something, annoyed, irritated about something, and he hates what he doesn't know, so, you know, yeah, I get that, I'm sure that when they wrote this, they thought this is a, a lot of boys are going to be able to recognize this, you know, and I get, you know, I, I definitely appreciate wanting to, you know, that kind of thing, wanting to wanting to appeal to to kids. I I prefer the school of thought that says instead of showing them something that's, you know, as bad as you know, that's no better than they are show them something that's at least a little bit better so they can aspire to that. 
you know, I, I get it. Like, you know, essentially the thing is, little boys are told that they're not allowed to feel positive feelings for others. You know, they're, you know, they're supposed to love women, but they're not allowed to... You know, if they're if they're friends with other boys, they have to watch. You know, they don't don't get too friendly because then the parents are and and you know peers and such are going to think they're gay as if there's anything wrong with that. So you know, they end up with all these you know repressed emotions. You know, and and also part of it is also that a lot of people think that the way to deal with boys being angry is to tell them that they're not allowed to be angry instead of trying to help them find a healthy way to to work through it maybe actually solve the problems which i know crazy I don't know where i got that idea so a lot of boys are like that you know i'm i can imagine when i was i don't think not when i was a teenager but when i was like eight or nine i might have been very similar to to mace I, I didn't watch this movie when I was, you know, back back then, but if I had, I think it would have just been frustrating to me, you know, so, yeah, I just, I wish that it had been, because the thing is, you could so easily have Mace almost immediately warm up to them, like, just have him start out scared of them, maybe even do a couple of shots that make us feel like, oh, wow, they actually do look kind of scary. But then he sees, no, 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 they're like, you know, one, like we see one of them like pet Sindel. You know, when you see that, how could you, you know, and he does, you know, he sees them be friendly to Sindel and he still like fires a shot. You know, just at that point, have him be like, oh, okay, they want to protect you just like I do and move on. You know, there are other conflicts you can have with with young male characters i have a similar problem with willow you know i've willow himself and man mardigan bicker way too much and man mardigan also constantly complaining about things which you know some of that you can understand he starts out you know when we first meet him he's like in a cage but it just i i don't it it's annoying for luke as well but luke pretty quickly moves away starts to move away from that you know like, when we meet him, he's like, oh, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna live on it, you know. But it was a power converter, big something. But then we see him with, um, with old Ben, and he's listening. He's, he's asking questions. He's, he's interested. That makes him much easier. You know, like, if the only thing you saw of Luke was that first bit where he's whiny, yeah, you might think, oh, he's a terrible character, but when you see, oh, he grows, you know, he, like, he's, he sometimes whines later, but he's actually trying to accomplish something, you know, like, he whines about Han not wanting to help the princess, but then afterwards, instead of just whining over and over, which is what Mace does, he says, she can pay you. You know, if they did that with Mace, and I get it, you know, Lucas, like, 18 when we meet him, Mace... I don't know, 13 or 14, so, you know, there's that. But then don't have him talk all the time. Like, just, anyway. Moving on to the... And, yeah, honestly, I've it's difficult to, to really get into the, the human characters in this mostly because of the acting, but also some of the material, a lot of the material. I did kind of like the, the giant rat. You know, it was legitimately creepy, and, you know, it's too bad that it's easy to see when the rat is a puppet, when it's stop motion, but still liked it. Wow, uh, somehow it's actually worse when Mace isn't pantomiming, and he's still, like, I know, I get it. At the time, some people, for some reason, thought, no, 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 I'll just, I'll say it, I'll maybe, I'll maybe talk kind of slowly, and they'll understand. And it's just like, why? It, there's this thing, 
I would I would love to tr I, I would love to understand why because it makes no sense to me but there's a lot of Americans who think everyone understands American you know it's I mean everybody I guess they think everybody learns American in school and then maybe doesn't keep it up later or something but yeah so if you just if you say it in American but say it maybe a little slowly or something that will eventually, you know, and it's just like, have you considered trying to understand their language and, like, maybe get in a, like, just, yeah. But, you know, at least early on he was pantomiming. That that was at least something. But, yeah. And in this, he's not even actually talking that slowly, and somehow they do understand him. And that's, again, a thing. Like, have him draw something, for example. You know, like, you, you have an opening here. This is a teachable moment. You could convey to, ch to kids, yeah, they might they might understand, but they don't understand. They don't speak English. You know, you got to do something else. But no, instead, they just eventually understand. You know, that was, a, like, I get, you know, in this, we don't have C-3PO. You don't have anyone who speaks uh, Iwaki, who speaks both Iwakis and Galactic Basic. But, like then you gotta do something else. You can't just have them speak English. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, we, we again briefly see the Gorax. We, yeah, we, we get the, like, the the wizard, Logre, is like showing them, and we see the Gorax. It's just really, really cool. I wish it was in way more in the movie. And... I just, I don't know why Mace is still being a jerk. The Ewoks have helped him and Sindel, but, you know, he's, you know, he's with Logre, and Logre is like, okay, you take this rock. And he's like, I don't want a rock. It's just, what is this? What, like, I know, I know there are kids that bratty and obnoxious, but I don't know any kids who want to be asked to like them in movies. Like, I mean, essentially, it's not even really punished. Like, this is the kind of thing, in other kids' movies, the brat is, like, the antagonist. And, like, s at some point or another, something bad will happen as, like, comeuppance. But that never happens for Mace. Let's see. And... Yeah, we're basically halfway through the movie before they actually leave on the caravan. And then we actually, and then it's like, oh, let's meet another Ewok. And it's, yeah. Sindel being sick changes nothing. She already trusted the Ewoks, so did the viewers. Mace didn't, didn't trust them before. He also doesn't trust them after. You know, like, it just, yeah. And it seems like Mace just has a problem with everything. Why would he not want the woodcutter Ewok? Even without seeing the Robin Hood bow and arrow trick with an axe. Like, it just... Just so... Yeah. It's very much this thing of, like, a young boy who's angry and he doesn't know why. So he's just angry at everything. And it's just, nobody wants to see it. We want to see it healed. We don't want to see it in action. And apparently some... Some user reviewers really really hated when like you know mace touches the thing it becomes a lizard um sindel touches it it becomes a mouse and and saying like oh, what does that mean what does that mean what do you mean what does it mean you can't possibly not understand that mace fails the personality quiz and sindel passes like obviously a mouse is better than a lizard in in this kind like some people are just intentionally stupid as just, like... And I'm sure I, I can... That I can imagine probably appeal to, to kids. You know, I forget... Do they actually... I forget if the narrator ruins it by explaining it. But I... You know, kids are going to understand. It. Kids are going to get that, you know, Mace... You know, they, they continue on the quest because of Sindel, not because... You know, and despite of Mace. Let's see... The bit where Mace falls into water, like, in theory, it's fine. It just goes on for way too long. Um, you know, it takes way too long for them to, to get him back out. 
um, we didn't need to see, you know, once we see that one branch doesn't work, I forget if they do it with two or if they actually do it with three, we only need to see it once, you know. Let's see. And... Let's see. Yeah, so Sindel and Wicked giggle, and according to the subtitles, Tinkerbell is twittering. I wonder if she was verifying if this was back when that meant, oh, this is the real person that they're claiming, not just they're claiming to be, or now when it just means, I hate minorities so much, I'll spend $8 a month to make sure that as many people as possible can know about it. Let's see. See. I like the spider. Very cool, very creepy, especially when like the you know, the magic thing makes its eyes glow green. It's a movie that's engaging and fits, but not as a whole. And then they ask Sindel to stay in the room, and it's like, why'd you bring her? You could have left her in the Ewok village. She had food, she had medicine, she could communicate. With the Ewoks, why did you bring her and then leave her that close? Like, and I mean, I think it's one of those things where, like, I'm sure kids are going to be like, yep, my parents are always telling me you have to stay here. But it's like, it's so unsatisfying story-wise. Let's see. Like, if the end of the movie is not going to feature... Uh... What happened? If if the end of the movie is not going to feature her, like I get her not taking part in the action or something, but like have the Gorax kidnap her, you know, some some have a reason for it to not, you know. And we see the Gorax again, and it's still really cool. The Ewoks act like kids a lot. Like I guess the ones we see a lot of are actually kids, but you know, it's again kids hypothetically want to see other kids and and beings that act like kids way too much of the climax in my opinion is Ewoks distracting the Gorax just the or is it just one Ewok whatever I you know they they do actually fight it at least a little which was decent though it's it kind of seemed like I will cut your toenails, you know, just, that was, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the dying Ewok is trying to be like, you know, you have my axe. And it's like, you need your axe. I'm not gonna take it. And they trip the Gorax. The old school bus. But it is kind of cool that, you know, the Gorax actually falls down this hole. And they do actually, you know, they hit it in the head with something heavy and, and various, you know, they do a couple of different things. We thought we'd lost you. We were so relieved. And, you know, it crawls back up and they attack it and it falls back down. Not bad. And... We should get out of here. Not the worst idea I ever heard. That was taking this role. And it ends with the, you know, yet another Ewok party. And the, the, I mean, see, the father, whose character name, I don't know. But the, yeah, the father goes from, what's that thing, to you and I are both, ha you know, lucky to be fathers, or something like that. That's, you know, if they had just done Mace that way, you know, it's also like, oh, wow, I get where Mace gets it from. Um, right, I actually don't have very much for this next section, but I'll do it separately still. Notes taken before watching, so... This is pretty funny. One one user you wrote. The movie ends when all the heroes venture into the cave of the Gorak. Discover that Mace and Sandel's parents are being kept in a massive hanging birdcage. They proceed to save them and 
kill the Gorax. But the funny thing is, the Gorax doesn't actually do anything that evil. Near as we can tell, the Gorax wasn't even going to kill anyone. It looks for all the world like this giant intelligent creature found some helpless stray animals in the woods, brought them back home, took very good care of them. If you've ever adopted a stray cat, imagine if that cat's family showed up a couple days later and wrecked your house and murdered you. That's what happened to the Gorax. Poor guy. And yeah, that's true. Like, it doesn't... Like, it didn't hurt the parents at all. As far as we can tell, you know, yeah, it, it picked them up and put them in a cage, and they were there for a while, for, for days. That's basically it, yeah. But yeah, um... Let's see. If you hit me up in the comments section, let me know. Um... Yeah, did you like the Ewoks better here or in Return of the Jedi? And yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my channel page, more to more links, stuff like that. Place it's just a, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reading and sharing his full thoughts on a movie. This week, two. I'm also doing one. I expect it to be Saturday, and one talking about my full thoughts on the most recent episode of. Uh, the Bear, one for Scream Queens, and uh, right, and and at least one about Star Wars, animated Star Wars. In other words, if uh, right, and recently the reviewing thoughts videos thinking about very similar to this one. In other words, if you want to do this like this year, look, you can check out my backgrounds. Was Casper next week? I hope you enjoyed watching as you uh, you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time. May the force be with you.